Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters, where I live stream every Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. Eastern on the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. I'm trying something new this morning in how I broadcast, so let's see if it works. Um, for those that may be new, it's working. For those that may be new, my name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center where we teach people all over the world how to empower animals and the people that care for them. And we do that through our live streaming services, which you can find on our website at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, I love this. So you can pay attention to our events. Um, if we're hosting an event at our center or if we're hosting that, or if I'm giving a workshop somewhere else. Um, so you may want to pay attention to that. You can find it on our Facebook page and on our website. And I'm here to tell you that our events are filling up quickly. <laughs> My 2024 has just exploded. And, um, I'm going to be traveling a lot this year. Um, and when I live stream at another location, I will let you know and let you know of the time difference. And just note to self, next weekend, Coffee with the Critters will be at 4 p.m. Eastern. Okay. I will recap on what the topic is at the end of this live stream. Um, you can join our email newsletter list. Let me know if you're liking what you see. I'm trying to change it up and put a little more tidbits of information on animal behavior training and enrichment in there. Um, you can also always email me um, on whatever questions you have or information. If you want to get in touch with me, you can get reach me at Laura, L-A-R-A, -A, at the Animal Behavior Um, And our work here focuses on using applied behavior analysis with animals. Um, we do that through, that through our memberships. Um, so just to recap, last weekend, um, I was at the Houston Parrot Festival giving a presentation on be careful with that bond, understanding and mitigating separation anxiety. And there I shared a behavior modification plan. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Beth. Good morning, Tim. Um, it was, I received a lot of good feedback um, saying how informative this presentation was. And I am planning on maybe giving this presentation online. And with that being said, it was so good to be back out um, amongst people um, presenting in front of a live audience instead of live streaming. Um, I love live streaming. Good morning, Tambry. Um, you know that my services, a lot of my services are based on live streaming, but let me tell you what I'm seeing in the community since the pandemic. A lot of people have been live streaming my work for, I don't even know how long, eight or nine years. The Animal Behavior Center is getting ready to have their 11 year anniversary in a couple of weeks. Um, so that's exciting. And I'm trying to figure out what I can do special for the 11 year anniversary of the Animal Behavior Center. But what I'm seeing in the, in the, in the community animal behavior training and enrichment community since the pandemic is everybody has started live streaming. And I think it's just a lot of people are getting overwhelmed with all their options. Something else that I don't like what I'm seeing is um, people now know that they can attend a live stream online. And if they don't make it, they know they can just watch the replay and what's happening is they're not watching the replays. And so the live streaming is positively punishing people learning. And 
making it convenient to do it when they have time. But what happens is they don't have the time. They don't watch the live stream. Um, so with that being said, it was great being back on the traveling lecture circuit. Um, you're going to see a lot of that this year. Um, Beth says she makes time. Good, good. Um, especially with you guys jumping on here this morning. Good morning, Diane. Have you seen that, Diane, in your field of work? I just, it was so good to be with a bunch of people. Um, and the networking is there. And so much when you attend conferences, it's all about the networking. Um, go to the different presentations that you can the ones that you can't, you're sitting down at lunch, dinner, cocktails uh, with real life people in front of your face <laughs> and learning from them and getting even, even more detailed information from them that you wouldn't get on a live stream. Good morning, everybody. Um, so, yep, this was just, I, I sponsored a table last weekend and invited several people to sit with me and it, it was great. Um, so pay attention to the Houston Parrot Festival in 2025 because we are. Um, Diane says, I love the networking. Yes, um, that is something a lot of people miss out on. Um, so to get started with Nails to Tails, what this is, is um, when it's my own behavior modification plan because so much information gets loaded onto my phone, my desktop on my computer, and my computer desktop is a mess. And so this is a way that I clean it up. And I know that after this Coffee with the Critters, these um, photos and videos are either filed or trashed, never to be seen again. So hopefully I can give you some good information. Um, so this is just what I cleaned up off my desktop this morning and I can't remember everything that it was. So um, I posted this in the newsletter. I'm really into keeping the Animal Behavior Center clean, organized. So this was a way that I organized my the zip ties with things I have at the center, an array of different sizes of zip ties, and we use them so much for enrichment that they get lost in the clutter and it becomes a mess. So I went through and took different cardboard tubes, cut them to various sizes and shoved the zip ties in according to their size. We do a lot of sprouting and microgreens to feed animals, an array of different species of animals. Um, so I found an extra planter and I just shoved all these um, cardboard cores with the zip ties inside of them. Um, okay, so this is a photo, a couple of photos from a topic I spoke on last week. Um, yes, it was geared towards parrots, but definitely not limited to, um, working, uh, working with separation, distress, anxiety, and the importance in keeping balance. Um, that was the topic of my presentation last weekend, uh, blue and jewel, the hyacinth macaws that good morning, Sharice, didn't I just see you last weekend? Um, Blue and Jewel, the Hyacinth Macaws, they are a bonded pair. Um, they are also very bonded to a couple of the people. Good morning, Deb. Good morning, Pat. Um, good morning, Wendy. They're also bonded to a couple of different people. Well, it has caused a behavior concern. And we have put a behavior modification plan in place. And I started this before I went to the Houston Parrot Festival um, and came back a week, not less than a week ago to see how it was working. And it is working beautifully. So it's important to type out this behavior modification plan. What are the goals? 
What are you seeing? Keep track of it. Is it changing? So Blue and Jewel are very attached to us at the center. They're very attached to each other. Um, we put this behavior modification plan in place. I went in with them. Where do they want to be? On my shoulder. Um, so a lot of times when you're working on behavior modification plans, um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Um, oh, a lot of times when you're working with separation, distress, and anxiety, if you do not put a behavior modification plan in place, it can lead to medical conditions. Um, so that was a topic of my presentation last weekend. And not only can animals become overbonded to their caregivers, they can become overbonded to each other to another animal, to a particular area. Um, and it's very stressful for me to see and experience. Good morning, Lynn. Um, so that was just a couple of slides I had left over on my desktop. When I came back from the Houston Parrot Festival, um, I met with some of the caregivers at the Animal Behavior Center. Hey, can you help me focus on this animal? Can you help me keep this behavior trained? So one of them was um, Bruce, the young American alligator, teaching him to open his mouth on cue. And I came back. I've had a couple of training sessions with him that I live stream these training sessions in the advanced membership. Um, good morning, Adrian. Didn't I just see you last weekend as well? And Carol. Um, so I asked them, do not teach the open mouth on cue. Um, just make sure he understands the nose target. Keep that happening, following the nose target around the enclosure. We started working with Bruce a little over a year ago. He has grown so much. <laughs> he is growing so fast. Um, and because he's not in brumation, um, we are continually feeding him every day. Uh, and when reptiles go into brumation, it's like a hibernation state where they don't eat. Um, our other two alligators are in brumation. Bruce is not. Um, so his training habit continues to happen daily. So a lot of people may say, why do you need to train an alligator? Why do you need to train them to open mouth on cue? So we're using the target stick. So when he sees it, not only does he follow it, I'm pairing it with the cue, which is the verbal cue, which is just open. And boom, his mouth opens and we're still feeding with tongs because he's so small. Oh, how big is he? He's probably three and a half feet long now. Um, because I train Elvis and Priscilla, the large adult alligators, getting your fingers that close to their mouth when they get that big is not what I would suggest. <laughs> so how I feed uh, Elvis and Priscilla is when I tar use a target to call them to me and they're standing right in front of me, I then ask them to open and that's and I can toss the food right in their mouth without the tongs so I don't have to get my hands as close. Um, so Bruce, for the past three or four days, I want to say is 100% understanding open mouth on cue. And how do I know he's understanding is when I show him the target and he goes to target to near the target stick and I say the cue open, his mouth is opening 100% in the past three to four training sessions. Um, so I wanted to show this because last week, the week before last, before I left, I was talking to Rachel saying, we need to increase complexities of the enrichment we are offering uh, numerous species of animals. And that is the parrots, the hornbills, the wolves, the lemurs, and the alligators. Uh, but definitely not limited to. So I got on Amazon the other day and I was like, I saw this. I was looking up complex 
um, foraging devices. We made this, this is not our photo, this is something you can find online. We made this probably about 10, 10 years ago. Hello, Snow. Um, 10 years ago for Milo the pig. And now I'm like, we can make this. Let's design something like this for numerous different animals, especially the hornbills. Um, so we're really focusing this past week on complexity of foraging. All of our, not all of our enrichment, a lot of our enrichment focuses on foraging, which is where the animal um, learns how to manipulate objects and get food from it. Uh, foraging is part of every single one of our behavior modification plans. One important component of our behavior modification plans, this is DC hanging from a toy um, to forage from it. <clears throat> Oh, Beth, that is a fabulous idea. She says maybe collaborate with Nina. I think what I just purchased two of her toys and collaborate on um, more complex puzzle feeders for animals. Um, so, so often we make enrichment too simple for our animals. And if a if an animal destroys something that I have put together for them in a less amount of time than it took me to make it, that will positively punish my behavior of making that toy again. I need toys to enrichment devices to be complex, offer choice um, and control for the animal. So the animal has control and studies show that most enrichment in animal environments to this day lack problem solving abilities. So this is a photo. I think I showed this before. <clears throat> We're working with three red rough lemurs. Um, and I use this as a test to see, we just introduced them all together a couple of weeks ago. I used this particular foraging, which was, is very basic, very simple. It's just cardboard tubes. I can't remember what we put inside of them with treats and food to see how these three lemurs would interact with each other, um, not only when first introduced, but when a novel stimulus is put in their environment um, containing reinforcers of high value. So the complexity comes in where I hung it, um, how I hung it, so they couldn't get to it by standing on their feet or standing on their back feet and reaching, uh, and reaching for it. I wanted to see, I wanted to increase the complexity by having them have to hang upside down to get to it. Worked beautifully. I was specifically watching for resource guarding, to see if they would start fighting for the food, um, not only the food, but a novel new stimulus in their environment. Nope, they didn't. Um, so in speak, I think this might be my last slide. Is this my last slide already? I don't know. And I wanted to show this photo because in the Parrot Project, um, our live streaming services for people that care for parrots, we're training a couple, a lot of different things, um, introducing two parrots to each other, increase in complexity, complexity in play gyms, the importance of moving birds around. My current work with DC, the Moluccan cockatoo that came to us from, that is here for training from uh, Parrot Hope Rescue in Manaway. This is the complexity of a play station, which is nowhere near being completed, but where the parrots who are on it can see the food dishes and the water dishes, but have to figure out how to get there. And we're making our play stations with movable items on them. So the next day they get on the play station where they were able to take a right turn yesterday is no longer there. They now have to go up. Um, so it's important to keep your animals used to change. Um, changing environments help prevent behavior issues out of boredom and predictability. Oh, there is one more slide. Um, 
this is, and I was just talking to, so I'm introducing people to new caretakers to the animals and um, telling them what to look for. We're really huge on enrichment here at the Animal Behavior Center, which is what led me into training because studies also show if you're using positive reinforcement training, it can be the animal's preferred form of enrichment. Good morning, Valerie, and welcome. Um, so Bess says, is that wrapped with green vet wrap? Yep, we wrap all of our play gyms, play stations with vet wrap because we make them out of PVC. And if we're working with parrots that can slip off, um, parrots that aren't flighted, it's important to have that grip and feel secure. That's why we use the vet wrap. So I'm talking about, I'm showing people at the center um, how to observe the animal's enrichment, see how they're using it, see what you can do um, the next time to increase complexity. Make sure that the step you take in increasing the complexity of the enrichment isn't too big because, because you can accidentally positively punish the very behavior you're trying to train. So we're always trying to increase complexity in enrichment through duration, period of time. That is our foraging toys are all based around intermittent schedules of reinforcement. Um, Stacy says foraging Friday idea. Yeah. Let me know, Stacy. Email me on what your, what your, exactly what your suggestion is, so I can make sure that we put this in Forging Friday. I believe this is my last slide. Nope, it's not. This one is. <laughs> I think um, we have a vet appointment for DC this coming Wednesday, and so we've been practicing in the Parrot Project, showing the crate training how we're getting them there. We are having to lure and now we're starting to fade out the lure. So the cue becomes the crate. When you see the crate, that can be the cue or the opening of the doors to go in. So he is crate trained. Um, yesterday we did a live stream in the Parrot Project showing just because they're in the crate does not mean they're crate trained. Be careful with those doors. Be careful with the steps that you take. Yesterday, we showed how we started lifting up the crate, bridging, delivering reinforcement, um, reinforcement, re reinforcers, and we are ready for the vet appointment. So don't wait for the vet appointment for the training to, to begin, because usually that's too late. Prepare. This is why we're teaching animals to open mouth on cue, using the target to get them to go to the scale. We're getting ready to show how we're using the target with Bruce to start getting him out of his enclosure, getting him on the scale, and getting him crate trained. So we're already preparing for crate training for we and we can implement this for his move back outdoors in a couple of months. Um, so with that, I just want to say, pay attention for a couple of details that we have coming up. Um, we have two, uh, we have two workshops that are now scheduled, um, on our website at the Animal Behavior Center. We've got a parrot enrichment workshop in April. We have our next understanding behavior through working, <clears throat> with birds workshop in may that one sells out every year um oh i was like where's my next slide um we also have an array of different services um, we've got people coming in for a day with the trainer um you can also learn from us online through our three different annual memberships that we offer foundations um, of animal training and behavior for people at home with their animals at home. We have our applied advanced animal training where we show an array of different behaviors right now. Um, I'm showing my work with Bruce. I'm getting ready to start showing my work with the three red rough lemurs. You're going to see our behavior modification plan we put in place for two timber wolves that are 
showing signs of being extremely fearful of an object that is in their enclosure um, that we need to counter condition and desensitize. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, what else do we have? For, oh, your next podcast is going to be recorded this coming week. Um, we have detailed one hour animal behavior and training podcast that we upload to the foundations and advanced membership every, the first week of every month. Okay. With this, I want to say next weekend, don't say I didn't warn you because I get a lot of people get upset when they miss an episode of coffee with the critters. Uh, but I try to give you a lot of advanced warning. I have been mentioning this for at least a month. Next weekend's Coffee with the Critters will be at 4 p.m. Um, on Sunday, I think it's February 11th, um, 4 p.m. Eastern. I will be bringing on um, Sabrina and Garrett from the very popular podcast called I Know Dino. Um, I've been listening to their podcast for several years, and I finally reached out and said, hey, Will you come on an episode of Coffee with the Critters? It's going to be fascinating because we've been talking about what is going, what we're going to, um, what we're going to talk about, primarily them. So come with your dino questions and come listen to this very fascinating podcast. And it will be my first time meeting them. Um, oh, is it Super Bowl Sunday? Well, I guess, I don't know. Um, you either watch Super Bowl or you learn about dinosaurs. <laughs> um, so with that, I want to say thank you for attending. Next week, 4 o'clock p.m., I know Dino. The weekend after that, I'm thinking about having a cocktails with the critters, which happens in the evening on Saturday. Um, so thank you guys for attending. And I hope to see you next weekend for Coffee with the Critters when I'm with Sabrina and Garrett from I Know Dino. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs>